Thompson. Today is Monday, February 6, 2023. This is the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee uh, meeting in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building and a quorum is present. Um, so members, we have eight items on the agenda, eight bills. Um, and oh, before I get started, I wanted to say that in accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Port from Burnsville, Minnesota, Senator Lang from Olivia, Minnesota. Um, so members, um, I'm given to understand that um, the first item, uh, Senate File 577, uh, will engender the most uh, discussion. So um, Senator Herr, um, we're going to jump, we're going to do two through eight, hopefully uh, as quickly as possible. If you do the math, we have about 15 minutes uh, in a two hour hearing for each item. So I'm hoping that we can dispense with each item in 10 to 15 minutes. If we can't, we might be forced to move on uh, to the next item and we'll just bring, um, we'll just bring some uh, items back at a future hearing to complete our discussion and debate. Um, also, members, I wanted to let you know um, a, a number of these bills uh, have fiscal notes or will have fiscal notes. I'll look to my fiscal staff to clue us in because those bills will have to uh, lay on the table um, and include uh, in a future budget bill. So just so you know, we won't move, be moving everything on to its next committee stop or to the general order calendar. So with that, Senator Herr. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate so, file 777, yes, which does uh, have a uh, fiscal note, so we will um, take testimony and debate amendments conversation and then lay that bill on the table. Pr please proceed, Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members for hearing Senate I, uh, Senate file summon some seven um, sound like a jackpot number, but it's on a different matter. <laughs> uh, Senate file summon seven seven would allow all people whose driver license has been suspended for financial reason to have their license reinstated so that they can drive legally while they pay off their debt. The driver license suspension we're talking about here falls under three categories. Uh, for those failure to pay a traffic ticket, failure to appear on a petty misdemeanor traffic ticket, and conviction for driving after suspension. In 2021, we passed a bipartisan bill with similar language, but didn't include license already suspended. The Senate file 777 will take care of those remain suspended. When this bill passed, uh, the Department of Public Safety would need to provide written notice to inform el uh, eligible recipient by December 1st, 2023, and the drivers must pay $20 fees in order to have their driver's license reinstated. Mr. Chair, members, suspending a person driver license for unpaid fines prevent them from full participation in the workforce and in their community. Department of Public Safety estimate that about 8,000 people would become eligible for driver license reinstatement under this legislation. So furthermore, uh, payment related suspension disproportionately affect BIPOC communities and low income families. So members and Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask for your support of Senate 5 Seven, seven, seven. I do have testifier here with me, um, Ms. Mary Allen Hing and Joel uh, Satin. Uh, I'll take any question as well uh, for now, or if the testifier, if you want to go to the testifier, they can come forward and present. Thank you, uh, Senator Her. I think we'll take um, your testifiers. Um, I believe they will be testifying remotely. Um, and then we'll go to questions, discussion, and amendments. First, I have Mary Ellen Hang from the city of Minneapolis. Welcome to the committee. Ms. Hang, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you, Chair Dibble. I am Mary Ellen Hing. I am the criminal deputy in the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. We prosecute misdemeanor offenses such as driving after suspension for Minneapolis. I have been a Minneapolis prosecutor for 25 years and the criminal deputy for 10. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Her for authoring this bill. Um, my office, and I have also spoken to Jessica Mahat McConaughey, who is the criminal deputy in St. Paul. Um, and the St. Paul City Attorney's Office joins us in support of this bill. Uh, there are three main reasons why I'm asking you to support this bill. First is uh, the equity of reinstating these older licenses. With the passage of the bill last year, which was a great start, and we are very appreciative to have that bill passed, while it impacts anyone moving forward, uh, there are still many left that are in similar situations that are suspended for unpaid fines or for failing to appear. Um, and we are asking that they be put on that same status and allow the opportunity to be reinstated. Um, it's always been my position as a prosecutor that we want to do everything we can to help individuals get a valid license because then they will have valid insurance and we want licensed trained and insured drivers on the road. It is better for public safety. It is better when there are accidents, which will happen that drivers are, are licensed and that they have insurance um, so that our victims can be made whole. Finally, we're finding that driver's licenses, as you know, are very important to people getting better jobs, which leads to stable housing, uh, better ability to take care of their families. And what we're finding, at least in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, is many individuals are having to set sometimes these very, very old citations, set them for court simply to be able to get reinstated based by reappearing on these cases. We have a huge backlog in Hennepin County of all sorts of cases from the pandemic that we are still trying to work through. And we simply do not need to spend court resources, prosecutor resources, public defender resources on these DAS cases. And so for these reasons, I'm asking you to please support this bill. Um, I think it is the right thing to do. My office has been reviewing old DAS cases and individuals that fit these criteria. We're going ahead and dismissing these old citations in our own way to try to uh, somewhat retroactively apply this. Um, and not all prosecutors are going to take those steps, but my office has. And so we appreciate your time and consideration and we hope that you will support this bill. Thank you so much. I will now call on Joelle Sather from the Defender's Office. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joelle Sather and I'm an Assistant Hennepin County Public Defender. I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today in favor of extending um, the driver's license reinstatement to those who were already suspended prior to the passage of the legislation in 2021. I have practiced as a public defender in Hennepin County for over 25 years, and for seven of those years, I handled only misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor cases, the majority of them being driving cases. The cost of each of these tickets can exceed $800 when you add the fine and associated fees. Most of the clients getting these tickets have children to care for, they drive older cars that tend to break down, and they live in areas that aren't near their jobs. And with the increased cost of almost everything, uh, the economic strain that they are feeling is very real. In my current assignment in the Public Defender's Office, I work with many clients who are making major life changes and wanting to address their old tickets and get their driver's licenses reinstated. Most of them have several tickets from their past for driving after suspension and minor infractions that prevent them from, that prevent their ability to get reinstated without first paying thousands of dollars in old fines and fees. The barriers that these old tickets present is the most significant and common reason that my clients remain suspended today. What I think is unclear is how easy it is to get caught in the system of suspension and, re and resuspension. And it usually starts with a basic like moving violation that someone forgets about or didn't have the money to pay or didn't pay at the right time. They don't realize their license has been suspended until they get stopped, they're told that they're suspended, and they're given a ticket for a driving after suspension. Now they have multiple tickets to address and they either pay them or they try to see a hearing officer and take a deal to resolve them. 
And they think they're doing the right thing by getting it all done and taken care of, but they don't realize because prior to 2021 in the new legislation that any resolution of that driving after suspension would cause a resuspension. So they leave there thinking they're in good standing and they can drive legally, but in fact, they've been suspended again. And then they get stopped and get another ticket. So that's how the suspension cycle begins and continues and makes it almost impossible to get out of. Ending the license suspension for the unpaid tickets in 2021 was a huge step, but we were disappointed that the people already trapped in this cycle were left behind. This bill extends relief to people whose suspensions occurred prior to the enactment of the 2021 legislation so that they can get their licenses reinstated and drive legally. I hope you will support the Senate file of 577 and remove the suspensions caused from these older tickets. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sather. Um, before uh, we return to uh, Chief Author Her, I was going to ask um, Ms. Boyd to briefly explain the fiscal note to us. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, there are three things to point out in the fiscal note uh, for Senate File 777. One is that um, the Department of Public Safety assumes there will be some necessary programming to the MinDrive system. Um, that is estimated to cost $24,000, and that will be absorbed in the DVS technology account uh, appropriation. <clears throat> uh, further, if you look at the bottom of page two of the fiscal note, there is an assumed cost of printing and sending a letter to eligible customers. Those printing costs are estimated to cost about $5,000, um, and that is the five that you see um, listed as the expenditure on the front of the fiscal note. And then finally, at the top of page three of the fiscal note, um, there is a section saying that um, there, there were likely be, or maybe potential revenue from retroactive reinstatement um, of these individuals, but that DVS cannot calculate that potential revenue, um, that the individuals may have been suspended for many years, may have moved out of state, may no longer be interested in obtaining a Minnesota driving privilege. Um, and that DVS cannot estimate the revenue or uh, what fiscal years that revenue may come in from a reinstatement fee. Great, thank you. All right, members, uh, questions, discussion, or amendments at this point? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble. Uh, could so, uh, s staff or somebody go through and just explain to me I, exactly what violations they could get a reinstated license for I, I mean, can you can you get it for driving after suspension or revocation? Uh, what what are eligible for reinstatement? Um, thank you. Um, it's either staff or Senator Her or or Ms. Odegaard could help explain that. Um, it's a fair question. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Anna Odegaard. I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. Um, and Senator Howe, I appreciate the question. Uh, yeah, so there are three categories that would, uh, of folks who could become eligible for reinstatement with the passage of this bill. One is anybody who has failed on a, a payment for any traffic violation. So if the traffic violation itself um, led to a suspension or a revocation for the driving behavior, that would not be impacted. It would be if it were a, a payment violation only, they would be eligible. The second category is failed to appear on a petty misdemeanor traffic violation. Um, those are when people fail to appear on petties, the prosecutors are able to um, certify them as a conviction and send that fine to collections. So there's already an accountability mechanism there. Um, and so it's, we, the, if somebody is only suspended on a failure to appear on a petty, they would be eligible for reinstatement. And then the third category is folks who had a tacked on suspension period for a conviction on driving after suspension or revocation. So if I get a, you know, if my license is suspended, but I drive and I get a DAS ticket, that's a $300 ticket. If I pay that ticket um, as a part of my conviction, the, the consequence for the conviction, I am resuspended. So what we see is folks who are trying to clear up those old tickets, they pay those old DAS tickets and they're resuspended. So this would eliminate that. This would, if somebody was suspended on that tacked on suspension period, they could become eligible for reinstatement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then I guess I got one other question, and it might be just a drafting area, but 
I would have to believe that if this bill passes, the effective date would be August 1st anyway. Is there a reason why we put August 1st in the effective date on the bill? Council. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair and members, it could, I'm speculating here, but it could be with an eye towards the omnibus bill. So the default for a policy bill by itself is August 1st, but if this were to get put into the omnibus bill, the default then drops to July 1st. So if they're looking ahead and want it to be August 1st under all situations, it's probably there for safety's sake. And so that actually does beg a good, this, this will um, be laid over for possible inclusion because it's a, a fiscal matter, it has a fiscal matter attached to it. Um, is uh, Senator Her or Ms. Odegaard, is August 1st preferable to what would otherwise be a July 1st effective date? Uh, I, I will say as soon as possible, but. Uh... All right, well, we'll flag it and figure it out All right. as it makes its way. Thank you, Senator Howell. Yes, Senator Howell. W one final question, and this, this would come back to, to it. If, if failing to pay your fine uh, is losing your license is a, is a, a uh, whatever, incentive, it, they're trying to incentivize you to pay your fine on time, because if you don't pay it, you're going to lose your license. Do it, does does the courts do the courts actually lose their you know their their efforts to incentivize you to pay your fine or you lose your license? What other what else do they have to incentivize you to pay your your fine? Mr. Chair, Ms. Odegaard. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Howe, for that question too. Uh, so the unpaid fines will be sent to collections after uh, there's an internal collections process where there's a five dollar late fee and then a twenty five dollar late fee. So the courts are still have that tool, those penalties to add to the overall fine to incent you to pay on time. When they send it to the Department of Collections, uh, the Department of um, revenue here for collections. There's an additional 20% surcharge added. Um, and then the Department of Revenue can essentially function as a debt collector. So they can use it, they can take it out of your tax refund, they can garnish your wages. Um, so the incentive to pay, say, a, a $300 ticket up front is that it's 300. Whereas if you default on that, there's the $5 late fee, then a $25 late fee, then a 20% collection surcharge, which is another $60. So the, the, the number, the, you know, the dollar amount goes up if you don't pay it on time. Senator Howell. All right. All right. Anything further, members? All right. With that, we will lay Senate file 777 on the table. I want to say jackpot um, for possible <laughs> inclusion. All right, um, I don't see Senator Westrom, so we'll move on to Senator Her if you just want to stay put. Um, and we'll take up Senate file 1344, the uh, farm driver's license modification. This is a late breaker, members. We got this, uh, we wanted to make this uh, kind of a driver's license, happy driver's license day, <laughs> quasi happy driver's license day, unlike the last driver's license hearing we had. Um, and towing day, so we uh, so we jammed this one and uh, and got it introduced so we could get it onto this hearing. So um, Senator Her, why don't you describe Senate File 1344 for us? Thank you, Chair Debo. Um, I'm here to present the to the committee for consideration on on uh, Senate File 1344. I appreciate uh, the opportunity that you're giving me uh, for this proposal. Uh, uh, in, in short, the, this bill expand the eligibility for uh, restricted farm permits beyond just young people who are growing up on a farm. I believe this will make our laws more equitable, expand opportunities in agriculture, and setting more young people on the path to build a career in farming. Under the current law, 15 years old who live and work on their parents' farm are eligible to earn a res restricted driver license to assist with farm work. In order to earn this license, they need to, one, complete a certified driver ed course, and two, pass the Minnesota driving test, and three, uh, submit a signed affidavit from their parents confirming the parents' permission and prove that the fam prove that 
it's a family's farm. With this uh, restricted license, those 15 years and older are allowed to drive only, one, to assist uh, with farm work, two, during daylight hours, and three, within 40 miles from the farm. This bill will extend the, ex extend the same opportunity to neighbors, extended family members, and others while retaining all the current protection and limitation on the license. I was uh, brought to this propo proposal by Minnesota Farmers Union and their members support this change uh, because it's often difficult to find people who are interested in getting involved in their operation. And when they do, this limit on farm license can be a barrier. I um, just uh, heard a message from today Commissioner Peterson uh, after he's been confirmed that he really liked this, the change of this um, the change of the, that we have here in Senate 5, 1344. So uh, thank you, Chair Dibble, um, for also being co-author with me on this bill. And I'll stand for question uh, from members. And Senator Herr, um, with apologies, I, I think we noticed a, a little tweak we need to make um, to the bill, an, uh, an oral amendment, if that's agreeable to the committee. I'll have... Uh, Council describe the slight tweak, um, and uh, we'll see if it's agreeable to the committee, um, or if you want it in writing, we can put it in writing. <laughs> um, Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The changes on page two, line three, to delete the word or, insert a comma, and after the word guardian, insert comma or employer. So then it will read the applicant's parent, guardian, or employer, and that matches the language on 2.1 and 2.2. Just an oversight. Um, so, Senator Herr, is that agreeable to you? That is agreeable. I, All right, uh, committee? Yeah. All right, so Senator Herr makes that oral amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Um, we have um, uh, Mr. Veldi, Tim Veldi, um, uh, online to provide testimony. Uh, Mr. Veldi, please proceed. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dibble. Uh, my name is Tim Veldi. I'm a farmer in Yellow Medicine County uh, between the towns of Granite Falls and Hanley Falls. I'm here in support of uh, Senate File 1344. I originally brought this to Minnesota Farmers Union uh, after my children uh, used the farm permit and helped me on the farm. And I had two young men who lived in town. Their father was a banker. Uh, they came out and helped me uh, on the farm also. One of them ended up a heavy equipment operator. The other one ended up an agronomist. They both still live in the area. I had a grandson who, uh, his parents were not farmers, but uh, he came out, helped me on the farm, and he uh, went to uh, diesel equipment school, and he's a diesel mechanic now locally. So I believe if we can expose young people to agriculture, it's uh, great for them, but it's also great for the farmers. We know that there's always a workforce shortage, and this way we can get uh, decent decent help out on the farm. I have a grandson right now who will be turning 15 this summer, and I'm hoping that uh, he can come and help me and legally drive over to the farm to help. Uh, I would like to say that this bill also has, besides the support of Minnesota Farmers Union, it is supported by Minnesota Farm Bureau, Minnesota Soybean Growers, Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association, Minnesota wheat growers, Minnesota turkey growers, and the Red River Valley sugar growers. So with that, thank you for giving me the time. I hope that the Senate can support this bill and it can go into law. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Veldi. All right, um, members, questions, uh, conversation or amendments? Uh, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble. Is there a is there a, 
How, I guess my question is, is, is how does the Department of Veteran, uh, of Vehicle Services or the, or the, uh, where they're going to, where they apply for it, is there a verification that he's working on the farm? Is, how is that process done that there's a, that they have something that verifies that they're working on the, on the farm? Who checks that? Uh, Senator Hur. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, for letting me take a dab at this, uh, answering this. Uh, there's, there's already a process in place, and usually it's apparent. The, 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 according to our current law now, is that the parent will confirm that it's parent's farm, but now we open uh, room for uh, neighbors, neighbors, uh, teenagers, or um, uh, friends or rel relatives who are at 15. And uh, in order to get there, they have the, the parents and guardian had to sign an affidavit, David's. And um, uh, in, in addition with the submission of property tax statement, and that document had to be notarized. If uh, I have here a sample of a, a document that needs to be uh, submitted to the public of safety, I, I haven't printed to you, but uh, just want to present to all that this is the form that uh, the uh, the family will need and the farmers as well. I hope I been clear and thorough about this part. If not, you know, I do have testifiers that can answer uh, much better, and we have. Uh, Senator Howe. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator Hur. I guess my question is is. So I see here on line 2.7, 2.8, that if the applicant isn't working for the parent or guardian, a written verified statement by the farm owner setting forth this necessity for the license, uh, I guess I, what would qualify as the necessity and is it the, uh, is it the, and who's, what, and I guess I'm looking at who they turning that into. The, the driver's license and examiner at DVS, is that who looks at it? Correct. My understanding is that we'll turn it to uh, uh, DPS. And then that gets kept on file. I'm seeing the shaking of heads. So, okay. To this point, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess Senator Howe didn't talk to me about this, but I, I had that same concern, and, and so I have the A3 amendment that would address the issue. So I'd offer the A3 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A3 if you'd like to start explaining it as it comes around. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. So what this does on page uh, two, line eight, after license, uh, it would insert and documentation demonstrating the applicant is employed by the farm owner, which basically documents that the applicant is working for the farm owner, which would show the documentation uh, there. So with that, I'd ask for a green vote. Can I see it? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Herr. I would accept this as a friendly amendment. All right. Senator Herr would recommend a yes vote. Anything further, members, on the A3? All right. All in favor of the A3, say aye. 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 Opposed, say aye. no. Oops, sorry. That was Senator Ford. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, the ayes have it. The motion passes. All right. Uh, Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And what I'm wondering is if, if there's an insurance impact here, uh, typically you, you do have to name the drivers on a vehicle. And, uh, and in this particular case, uh, you, you might even have some non-blood related drivers or hired people, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, should, should we have proof of insurance that goes along with this? Um, when I was 15, I could get my, my license. And what I did on the farm was sometimes I would take things to the grain elevator or other places. Now, we didn't have any interstates near us, but uh, 40 miles away, is uh, there's interstates there, so we're talking about 15-year-olds uh, driving on the interstates, and uh, I think they, we need to be sure that they're insured. Well, um, Senator Herb, if you don't mind, I'll take a stab at answering. Uh, um, yeah. uh, Senator Carlson, the, the thing to keep in mind is that um, this... Um, type of license exists already. 
Um, and it's in those instances when um, the young person is working for their parents on the farm where they live, and this is a simple expansion to allow young people who live near that farm. Um, so I would, I would think, and I would help have council maybe help me um, confirm that that issue of insurance um, would, would already be resolved by the fact that um, this type of license is available already. We're just slightly modifying who would have access to this kind of driving license. It's restricted to 40 miles. The interstate issue, you know, I, I would assume that uh, um, the young person who can have this kind of restricted provisional license um, would be dri could quite possibly be driving on interstates. Council? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I think the only other piece of information I'd add is that uh, this is like a license to drive, you know, any any of the vehicles you need for the farm work. So it's not for a specific vehicle. So whatever, whenever those vehicles are licensed or registered, and you get your tabs just like everybody else, you go and you show your proof of insurance at that point in time. Um, but so this is this is less vehicle specific, more person specific. So I don't know that you need the insurance requirement here. And Senator Carlson, the insurance would travel with the vehicle. Like when you loan your vehicle to anyone, they're insured while driving your vehicle okay, so under your insurance. Uh, Mr. Chair, so that, does that mean that uh, that the drivers have been declared when the insurance is purchased? You know, that, I guess I'm I'm concerned if there's a you know if you don't automatically insure everybody when you buy a car or when you insure a car. Um, you know, and especially in in the case of a 15 year old, I know how I drove when I was 15. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to be sure that that is covered. And I don't know if well, it is. Well, I'll tell you, we're, we're holding this bill over, and we need to move along. And we're not going to resolve this insurance issue today. I think it's, it's in hand. When you loan your car to someone, they're, they're covered. Um, Mr. Chair. Senator Jusinski. I see we have a representative in the back, uh, Mr. Aaron Cocking, who might be able to answer that question. If you'd open it up for him to come forward, I think he might be able to answer that. Certainly. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Aaron Cocking with the Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Um, I guess your question I had not planned on testifying today, um, but I think to your question, the, the notion of a farm vehicle is, my assumption would be, would be on a commercial policy where unlike a personal auto policy where you would potentially have coverage issues for people who are non-family members, uh, is probably picked up if this is specific to a farm license, farm vehicles that are covered under a farm commercial policy, I think you're probably, there would probably be coverage there. Thank you. I'm happy to come talk to you more, Senator Carlson, and we can, we can make sure, but um, since you're laying this bill over, we can get a Thank you, Mr. Right, Chair. For you. Senator Howe. All right. I got one question, and, and it wouldn't be for the, you, know, the, you you, you covered my, my question, so uh, my question would be for DVS, actually. Uh, you know, with the, current, with the current process that we have, how often do we find uh, refusals to issue these licenses under the current uh, family member qualifications and do you expect to have any increase in that with the new applications of people that aren't related in farm application? Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and respond. Mr. Chair, Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, um, I don't have the data uh, in front of me in terms of, of denials of these applications. Uh, uh, and we do anticipate the volume of applications to increase with this, the passage of this language. Uh, it, it's hard to predict what those exact numbers are, uh, but I can certainly check back with the team and, and follow up uh, with any data if we have any. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, members? So with that, um, Senate file 1344, I believe, has a um, fiscal note in the works, so likely we'll 
will trigger um, a fiscal implication. So we will lay Senate file 1344 on the table um, for possible future inclusion. Members, I'm announcing that I will take Senate file 176 off the agenda. That's a bill that I was gonna present. I think we're going a lot slower than I anticipated. Um, so we're gonna take that one out of, out of the mix for today. Um, and uh, we'll move on to, still don't see Senator Westrom, so we'll move on to Senator, Senate file 625, uh, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Herb. Senator Jasinski, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you say Senate File 625 was the first one? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 625 is ahead in front of you today. Uh, was brought to me by Minnesota Towing Association. Uh, and just an effort of time, I'll just turn it right over to my testifiers, and they'll go through the bill, and, and we'll try and get through as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. All Chair. Right. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Sure. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lance Klatt. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Professional Towing Association. I'm here today along with members of the MPTA to ask for your support of Senate File 625, authored by Senator Jensinski. This bill relates to situations where a towing operator is specifically requested by law enforcement to tow a vehicle. Under current law, when a towing operator is requested to tow a motor vehicle by a law enforcement officer, the operator has a lien on the motor vehicle for the value of the storage and towing and can keep the possession of the vehicle until the lien is lawfully discharged through payment of the fees. That is the present law. It is like when a tailor is asked to repair clothing, they have a possessory lien on the item of clothing until the bill is paid by the customer. The same is true with motor vehicles and the lien for towing and storage, which is found in Minnesota Statutes 168B. All this bill does is expand the lien beyond the towing and storage to also include the costs involved with the recovery and storage of cargo and accident site cleanup when towing operators are asked by law enforcement to assist at major accident sites where cargo is involved and cleanup is necessary to protect both the public roads and the environment. Cargo can include anything from food to lumber to hazardous materials and everything in between. When our members are asked to assist in these types of situations, the work and the costs involved can be extensive. We just want to make sure that when law enforcement asks for the assistance of towing operators, that the law takes into account the true costs involved with large and necessary cleanup efforts. This bill was included in last year's trans transportation ominous bill, and we are hoping your committee will again support this proposal this year. We very much appreciate your consideration of Senate File 625. We thank Senator Jasinski for recognizing the need to expand the current statutory protections for our industry in these limited circumstances. I have a, tow I have a towing member, Brett Letourneau, owner-operator of mine of Citywide Service sitting next to us here today. Uh, if there's a question intended for a towing operator, a specific ask of an example where this legislation is helpful. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, my name is uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Brett Letourneau. I own and operate Citywide Service Corp, uh, a towing company in the northern suburbs. Uh, I've served as past president of the Minnesota <coughs> Professional Towing Association. And this bill is, is uh, hoping to, to get us some protection in, uh, for the work that we do when, when we go out on jobs, uh, specifically for commercial type things. It's not going to really apply to your average passenger motor vehicle accident. Um, it's gonna apply to the, to the big jobs where commercial stuff is involved, big trucks, cargo that they're hauling. And when we go out on a job, we have no guarantee of payment. Um, we're hopeful that there's insurance involved and if there's not, that the vehicle owners will have the wherewithal to be able to take care of the bill. Uh, just for an example, uh, the other night, my company was called out at two o'clock in the morning for a uh, trailer, uh, truck trailer accident. Uh, by, uh, it, had, it was a FedEx truck full of uh, cargo, and the the, uh, the the truck pulling the trailer was a was an independent contractor, and he just had liability insurance on his truck. So 
the work that we did, we had you know a crew of six people at two o'clock in the morning for four hours. We had about five hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment to be able to take care of the accident out there, and uh, we didn't have any kind of a lean on the cargo, so we had let FedEx come and get their stuff, and now I'm sitting with the truck with no payment. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. Open to any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Draczynski, anything? Uh, nothing further, Mr. All Chair. Right. All right, members, questions, amendments, discussion? The one, uh, the one question, Senator Draczynski, I have, um, and I think uh, we had this discussion in my office on the subject with the with the proponents, and that is, um, uh, from what I understand from the testimony and from our conversation, um, the accident site cleanup when it comes to you know, cargo, et cetera, um, is really focused on um, you know, accidents and spills of a commercial nature. Um, the, the concern is um, uh, twofold. One is um, driving up costs of recovery of Private passenger vehicles from a from a an impound you know a, a tow operator's lot. Um, so that's one concern. I don't know if it's totally resolvable here in this conversation. The other is um, as it interacts with the retrieval of contents um, issue, cargo versus contents. Um, is there a is there a distinction there that that we we make, um, particularly when it comes to you know. Um, Putting a lien on the car, you know, for the purposes of you know, recovering contents, are those resolvable issues? Or you know? sure, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, um, this we're hoping this legislation is really is, is fixing a problem we have in the commercial industry, and it's not intended for passenger cars or of those contents. So. Um, our organization, if, there, if somebody want to offer up um, some kind of an amendment or type of amendment that would that would exclude, and we could work with oh, Ron Elwood's gone here, but um, work with legal aid to amend it to, to make sure that those uh, protections are in place for for some of those individuals. Our organization is okay with that. All right, that's great. That uh, gives me a lot of reassurance. Um, council. So, um, Senator Jasinski, this, this bill could move on. It doesn't have a fiscal implication. Um, yeah, so it would go from here to, to general orders, but could we hold it for just maybe uh, till, till Wednesday in, in the interest of maybe working up a little bit of language that we could add to it that would resolve that question? Yep. I thank have. you, Mr. Chair. We can do that. All right, thank you. Thank you. So with that, members, we will um, lay Senate File 625 on the table and revisit it. Um, this coming Wednesday. All right. Thank you. Thank that you. Was, oh, Senator Drzezinski, why don't we uh, keep you at the table um, and take up your Senate file 1065. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate file 1065 also comes from the MTA. Uh, this is one we also heard last year. As we, as you know, we've done some exceptions for some oversized vehicles. An example would be a milk truck. Uh, in this example, if a milk truck went out uh, and was overweight uh, during restrictions uh, and got stuck or stalled on the side of the road, uh, many times the, the tow recovery vehicle that comes is overweight as well. Uh, what this would do, allow the overweight tow vehicle to come pick up the stranded uh, uh, over sized vehicle. So that's the summary, uh, but with that, I'll turn again to my testifiers who wants to expand on that. All right, thank you. Please reintroduce yourself and proceed. Absolutely. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Lance Klatt, Executive Director of the Minnesota Professional Towing Association. I'm here today along with members of the Minnesota Professional Towing Association to ask for your support for Senate File 1065, 1065 I apologize, authored by Senator Jasinski. We would very much appreciate the committee's support of Senate File 1065, authored by Senator Jasinski. This bill is a common sense measure that helps towing operators do their job without technically violating current law due to anomaly in the statutes. This bill was included in last year's Senate Transportation Omnibus Bill, and we were hoping for your committee's support again this year. As many of you know, there are local and seasonal weight restrictions that apply to heavy vehicles on certain roads, but certain exemptions exist for particular types of vehicles, including garbage haulers, utility trucks, school buses, milk trucks, etc. However, if any of those exempted vehicles were to break down, land in a ditch, or crash into a body of water, 
there's no way for a towing operator to legally remove the vehicle because towing vehicles themselves are not currently exempted from the weight restrictions. All this bill does is make it clear that towing operators are able to recover another vehicle that is on inoperable on a public roadway, has entered a public body of water, or itself exempted from local or seasonal weight restrictions. The exemption for towers would only apply while traveling to or from the recovery scene or actually towing this, the stranded vehicle. We have worked with the Department of Transportation on this bill and have incorporated their suggested language concerning a cap on the overall weight that would be exempted. The bill provides that the towing or recovery vehicle must not exceed a weight of 20,000 pounds per single axle to avoid any undue damage to the roadways. That language came directly from MnDOT. In putting this bill together last year, we also spoke with the Minnesota Association of Townships and the Association of Minnesota Counties to make them aware of our proposal, and we have been told that they are fine with our bill with the suggested changes from MnDOT. They fully understand why we need this legislation and understand the importance of clearing vehicles from public roadways for public safety reasons. We appreciate Senator Jasinski's advocacy for this common sense bill, and we would appreciate the committee's support of Senate File 1065. Again, I have Brett Letourneau from Citywide Service here with us this afternoon uh, to address any questions that I may not be able to. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I also uh, forgot I do have an A1 amendment, technical amendment, uh, that was uh, brought to me by MnDOT, uh, and it basically says the $300 fee would be deposited in the trunk highway fund. Uh, unless you want any other further explanation, Ms. Stengel might be able to do that, but I think it's fairly straightforward. All right. We'll just, uh, for good form, we'll make sure the amendment gets around to everyone before we vote. Senator Jasinski offers the A1 amendment, an author's amendment, originating with the agency, technical in nature. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, members, questions, discussion, further amendments? All right, so Senator Jasinski, I think we do need to hold this one over for possible inclusion. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Time. Chair, and thank, thank you, you committee members. So we hold Senate file, Senate, Senate file number 1065 over for possible inclusion. Senator Coleman. Oh, Senator, Senator Coleman. Actually, I guess we're going to jump to Senator Westrom. My apologies. So. He's just coming back. He's uh, on his way in from the Ag Committee. We summoned him, so... Welcome to the committee, Senator Westrom. You have Senate File 111. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, um, Senate File 111 is uh, referred to as the Disabled Relative Driver's Permit. Uh, this would be a limited driver's permit, uh, much like the farm permit um, allowed in Minnesota for uh, children, of a family or uh, that, that have a disabled relative. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, let me back up just a little bit, uh, get everybody to think about your own campaigns. Um, maybe some of you are in a unique position, but I bet most of you, when you think of uh, starting running for office, who did you call on first? Uh, it's usually not the guys in the next, or the gals in the next town over. It's usually not uh, people the other end of town, or necessarily even people at the end of your street. It's your family. And family is kind of like family farmers. Uh, family always uh, 
is obligated to campaigning is a lot of the same as you, many of you probably experience in your own campaigns. A family helps out a lot. And um, this idea came uh, to me over a variety of different ways. And I've been uh, talking to uh, multiple people, but the concept would be much like the farm permit, which is very common out in rural Minnesota. Uh, farmers, uh, family farmers, uh, children, daughters, and sons are able to uh, take their driver's test. They have to pass the test and go through the uh, training. Uh, but at 15, they can get a limited driver's license uh, to help out on the farm and help in the family uh, business and the endeavor. Running for parts, uh, sometimes feed, uh, running errands for the farm, uh, during certain hours of the day. And so um, uh, my daughters, who some of you have seen over the years, uh, twin daughters, uh, recently had their license, uh, turned 15. They're actually 17 now. Uh, but as they were going through this stage and I was talking to other people and uh, experiencing it myself, uh, uh, being visually impaired, um, looking forward to the day that your children could get their license and be a help uh, for transportation, uh, running errands to going to events. And it all kind of started coming together. And I was talking to some other people and uh, the idea is why uh, not have a similar disabled relative permit for 15 year olds with limitations for helping out the family and uh, transportation needs thereof. And so, um, members, that's where this bill came from. Uh, very much like the farm permit, uh, drafting it with Senate Council, uh, trying to um, model it largely with those types of limitations, a 40 mile radius, uh, so, uh, and, and from hours of 5 a.m. to 12 p.m., which is also uh, matching some other uh, limitations of driver's license or or provisional license that we have. Uh, and so that's where uh, this language came forward uh, for that reason. And so, Mr. Chair, uh, happy to take some questions, but actually I have uh, Trevor from the Council on Disabilities and uh, uh, to testify, and I'm not sure if there's one more or not that was able to make it today. All right. Um, please come forward. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. My name is Axel Kylander, and I'm the Public Policy Associate for the Minnesota Council on Disability. The Minnesota Council on Disability is an independent state agency which represents and advocates for all Minnesotans with disabilities. Uh, joining me today in the back is David Fenley, our ADA director, who will be available to answer questions. We would like to thank Senator Westrom for bringing Senate File 111 to us. And we would also like to express our strong support for this bill, which would create a disabled relative driver's license that gives 15-year-olds the opportunity to help their relatives with disabilities. For many Minnesotans with disabilities who cannot drive, it can be a challenge to find reliable transportation, especially if they do not live near a regular metro transit route. The Minnesota Council on Disabilities supports any policy that expands transportation options for Minnesotans with disabilities. Senate File 111 is especially beneficial for elderly Minnesotans and Minnesotans with disabilities who live in greater Minnesota where transportation options are limited. Additionally, we are experiencing a home care workforce shortage, which severely limits the number of available workers to provide transportation services for Minnesotans with disabilities. This bill would introduce a new infusion of young people who can assist their disabled relatives in running errands, going to medical appointments, and most importantly, give them more opportunities to be integrated into the communities of their choice. There are roughly 75,000 15-year-olds in Minnesota. If even a fraction of those applied for the disabled relative's driver's license, it could still help thousands of Minnesotans with disabilities. We have seen the success of the farm work license in providing additional help from responsible 15-year-olds in our agriculture sector, and we believe those same responsible 15-year-olds could help Minnesotans with disabilities remain in their homes and live more independent lives. We urge the members of the Senate Transportation Committee to support Senate File 111 and give Minnesotans with disabilities 
more transportation options in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions, members? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Western, for bringing this forward. So is there a definition of, di of disability anywhere? Is there a generic one? Or what do we base our, uh, the definition of disability on to that would apply to this type of license? Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm going to defer to counsel. Um, but I, right offhand, I don't know if we have an exact uh, definition in this uh, this bill, but uh, maybe council can help me out if there's a current de de definition already or uh, else uh, we can talk about more, more of a definition. Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, there is no definition in the bill and is, I'd have to double check, but I'm guessing there's not a definition for chapter 171, but there's probably one somewhere else that we could link to. So we can, I can work with you on that, okay. Senator Westrom, if that's something you'd like. Okay. Would that be agreeable, uh, Senator Westrom? Very good. And S Senator Jacin sorry, I can't tell where you're, which side of the table you're I'm over here, on. Tori. You're looking right at me right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These microphones. Uh, so that, that, that's a good question. Thank you. And then just one follow-up, if I could, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Uh, so would the individual have to be in the vehicle with the disabled person, or can they, like, run errands on themselves, or, or what's the intent of the language, how the, how the person uh, that's helping the disabled person would have to be in the car with them or not in the car, or can you explain that, please? Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Jasinski, uh, the, the intent would be either, uh, much like the farm permit uh, might be running a mom or dad to a field to pick up a tractor and then driving back home separate or, uh, but, but also running errands, getting parts, uh, other things uh, in the situation. I think with a disabled relative, it might be picking up prescriptions. It might be uh, picking up, uh, you know, ambulatory equipment, uh, might be helping them grocery shop, uh, running, running those common errands within that limited Cir circumference, uh, so, so it'd be modeled after the farm permit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Members. Yes. Senator Carl. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Howe, are you next? Uh, we'll go with, we'll go yeah. Senator Carlson, then Senator Howe. All right. Senator Thank Carlson. You, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if these uh, licenses, like, you know, we have the farm license and now we have the, uh, um, what was the other one that we just passed? We, but they have uh, restrictions on when the, the person is allowed to be driving. And the last one was different than this one. This one's 5 a.m. to midnight, and the last one was daylight hours only. Are these licenses going to be identified so that uh, you know, if the, uh, whomever is going to be looking at them knows what type of license it is and whether the person is le legitimately driving? Um, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair. Um, my recollection is the farm permit has a certain designation on it now, but I, if somebody's here from DPS to confirm that, or perhaps Senate Council could, uh, I thought that used to be the case, unless that's changed over the years. Um, and, and so also if, if, if this had a similar designation, uh, I think, I think uh, that would be appropriate or similar to what, what's being done with the farm permit now. Uh, I believe there is a certain designation, but I'd, I'd defer to uh, the department to maybe update us on uh, what the latest practice is. Director Zhang, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson. Uh, the oh, Director, farm... please uh, identify yourself formally. Thanks. Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Carlson, uh, on the farm license, there is a des uh, restriction on the back of the card. Uh, we assume that for this language, we would use uh, the same designation. Carlson. I guess, uh, Mr. Chair, and I uh, um, can't remember your name, but, uh, but it, it would designate that this is a special license, or would it designate that this is a license due to disability or due to uh, farm work? Director Chung. Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, uh, the restrict, it would actually be a restriction on the back of the card, and it would have the letter J, a restriction J, and, and um, law enforcement, but it would come up when they 
when they ran the card, what the J designation stands for. There are other designations, and uh, for for real estate purposes, we just have a, a simple uh, designation or res uh, restriction on the back of the card. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we had Senator Howe next, or was that to this? To that point, so. Right, thank you, Senator Zinsky. Uh, sorry, Senator Howe, but just to that point, so you just said, and again, this committee just passed last week a bill for driver's license for non-citizens that could not be any different. And it specifically was testified it should not be any different than the other driver's license. And now we're finding out, and just this example is, for this type of driver's license, it has to be designated in the back. I think it's a little ironic that we have a double standard here that we just passed out of this bill, out of this committee a week ago or 10 days, whatever it was, that the driver's license had to look identical to a class D and now we have this permit that's saying a farm is already existing that is different. I, I just think that's a little bit ironic that we uh, didn't pass that out of committee last time, uh, allowing for a different type just like this is that we couldn't do that, but we can do this. So not against your bill, Senator, uh, Wester, or Senator Westrom, but I'm saying it's a little ironic for our committee members here are voting for this and today that we didn't allow a different type of license for non-citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Zinsky. Senator Howe. Uh, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but was it a, is, is it a, on the effective date, is this a typo or is this uh, on purpose to go not be an effective till July 1, 2024, is that supposed to be 2023? Or is there a reason why we bumped out over a year? Senator Westrom. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, that's an oversight on my part. Uh, I, I guess uh, J July 2023 would be a friendly amendment and uh, probably just council had to pick a date and, and, and I think it's probably that. Lexi, is there any other reason you can think of? I, I, I just didn't. I didn't catch that. Um, Director Zhang, is there a reason it needs to be out? Yeah, okay. He's shaking his head. Okay, so um, I'll make that motion. I'll make that um, oral amendment to make it 2023 instead of 2024 right. on whatever line it is. Under how on line 2.5 changes 2024 to 2023. Questions, members? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. All right. Um, and then, Senator Westrom, I, I think we had gotten uh, an email which you acknowledged that um, with a number of questions um, uh, from from the agency. Would, um, and this bill is being held over regardless because it's uh, uh, <laughs> has a fiscal note, um, okay. which uh, Ms. Boyd oh, is not done. Yeah. Oh, it's, which is not done yet. So, okay. um, but it will trigger a fiscal note, and so it needs to be held over for possible inclusion in our budget bill. But the original point I was making was um, there was an indication from your office that you're perfectly amenable to working through some of the questions that were raised by the agency as we move on and our and way Mr. towards Chair, the next step for this bill. If you have just a minute or two, I'd welcome the agency to comment on it just briefly. They, they've uh, mentioned to our office that there's, there is a current allowance for some medical uh, reasons for families to get a license at 15, and they thought it might fit better into that category that already exists, uh, maybe uh, meeting the intent of this bill as well. And that's what I'm happy to d discuss with them. They, they wanted to avoid confusion between the two Great. and rather have them link up and be harmonious if we can, so. Great, yeah, why don't we hear about that just for the matter of discussion and public record. Director Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Uh, yes, there is a, a, a med what we call a DVS, a medical license, and I, <coughs> I, I can't, I don't have the reference for the statute in front of me, uh, but it is essentially a license that allows 15 year olds to uh, drive, um, and it requires the attestation from the parent and from a medical provider. Uh, we think that with some adjustments to that language that we could include uh, this population that this bill is proposing to uh, support. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, that, that uh, concludes my testimony. Uh, statute 171.04, if I'm remembering right, I just was looking at it uh, before, yes. before committee. But uh, I'd be, I look forward to meeting with uh, them further on this. So we just kind of were working this out earlier today. And so, Great. Mr. Chair, committee members, I appreciate your indulgence, uh, appreciate your support, and uh, 
look forward to working with you as, as the committee continues to move forward. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Anything further, members? With that, we will lay Senate file number 111 over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus finance bill. Senator Coleman. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, let's talk about the artist formerly known as Prince. As many of you know, Prince Rogers Nelson was an icon who made massive contributions to American culture, music industry. He's a point of pride for the state of Minnesota and moved to a little place called Chanhassen. I was first made aware of how important he was to the city of Chanhassen when upon being sworn into the Chanhassen City Council, the very first issue we had to tackle was what to do with his land with no living will. I not only heard from neighbors and Chanhassen residents on this, I received emails from around the country, including celebrities who knew Prince, trying to tell us what he would have wanted done with that land. With a five to zero approval from the city of Chanhassen and the grassroots efforts of friends and neighbors of Prince, they are hoping to memorialize his importance to Chanhassen through the Prince Rogers Nelson Memorial Highway. This seven mile stretch of Highway 5 would be designated as such. And while there is a fiscal note the effort and the grassroots organizers on this have already raised the funds necessary to cover the cost of the sign. There are two uh, minor concerns that have been brought up uh, by MnDOT. One being that the, there's a 45 mile stretch, I believe, of a former senator uh, that's already been designated as a memorial highway. The family has indicated their support for changing this seven mile stretch. Uh, to that of Prince Rogers Nelson Memorial Highway, the other being the color of the sign. And if you can tell today by my uh, attire, uh, we are hoping that it could be purple. Now I believe that there is a federal manual that, that says that memorial signs should be brown, but I think that this is one exception worth making. And I don't believe it sets a precedent because there's not really any precedent quite like that of Prince. My hope is that with the creative thinking and the help of this committee, that we can deliver for a community still mourning the loss of and celebrating the life of an icon. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe I have two testifiers online. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Yes, we have uh, Robert Finn and Mark Webster. Uh, I have Robert Finn listed first, so Mr. Finn, if you would uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure, sure. I hope everybody can see and hear me. Um, I'm. Uh, my name is Bob Finn. I'm a 29-year resident of Chanhassen and a co-organizer of this Prince Rogers Nelson Memorial Highway uh, initiative we're uh, trying to do along with my partner, uh, Mark Webster, who I've uh, gotten to know over the last few years as we've uh, worked towards this initiative. Um, yes, first of all, wow, uh, thank you, Senator Coleman, for such a great introduction and for wearing purple today. That's, that's awesome. And for authorizing, you know, or authoring this, uh, you know, exciting, important uh, bipartisan bill that we feel, SF-279. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what else I can add. You know, we have raised the money through our GoFundMe site and through other efforts, uh, zero cost to taxpayers. We've received to date uh, close to 4,000 petition signatures that uh, on our change.org site. Um, we have the full support of Prince's family members, including uh, Sharon Nelson, Johnny Nelson Jr., Brianna Nelson, uh, and among all the others uh, with their full support and including that of uh, Paisley Park Management. They're fully on board as well. Uh, she alluded to the, uh, um, uh, you know, with Augie, uh, Rep State Representative Augie Mueller, who has a portion of this highway, and we have their full support as well. Um, 
we've been uh, you know in contact with MDOT on this, and you know we you know, we're, we're we're very flexible through the working through as the signage, and hopefully this uh, legislation approves, and we can be uh, moving along to exact placement, color, and everything else that goes with that. So. Um, you know, we have the, the, the locations identified, two of which uh, going um, westbound on Highway 5 and then coming um, uh, eastbound on Highway 5. So we've identified locations for that for those signs. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what else I can add other than we know that he was a very generous person. You know, he regu regularly donated his time and his money to various charities, school organizations, many in our own communities uh, that, that benefited greatly from his generosity. And, you know, he was a, a, a philanthropist of epic proportions, and he did it quietly and proudly. So um, that's about all I have to uh, uh, add uh, that uh, Senator Coleman hasn't already said. So just in, the, in closing, thank you so much for your consideration of this very important bipartisan bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Finn. Uh, Mark Webster. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, we can see Sorry, you. how are you all doing? Very well. Please introduce yourself for the record. Um, if you're able to uh, put on your video, that would be appreciated, and proceed with your testimony. Please introduce yourself and, and proceed with your testimony. Thanks. Can you see me now? We can see you and we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Mark Webster, M-A-R-K-W-E-B-S-T-E-R. -E -E Go ahead. And I guess I'm here to discuss the uh, Prince Rogers Memorial Highway. And um, um, I, I, I guess uh, uh, to, to, I didn't get to hear what Bob said already. Uh, but uh, we're just here to uh, try to extend the highway from Highway 5 uh, to uh, Audubon. Um, I think uh, um, it's, it's a good opportunity to honor an uh, individual that has been born and raised in the state of Minnesota, has done a lot for the state of Minnesota and Chan Hansen in the world. Uh, I think also... Um, It'd be good for um, Chad Hansen that um, we can honor Prince in that way. Thank you so much. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, the contributions that Prince made to mm -hmm. Minnesota and particularly Chan Hansen were significant. And it is the uh, belief of the city Prince's neighbors and friends in the area, that this is a great way to honor those contributions, and I would greatly appreciate your support moving this bill forward. Great. Uh, members, any questions, comments, amendments? Senator Herr. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Coleman, uh, just a trivial, trivial question, but uh, and not a necessary answer. Give answer if you don't know the answer, but I wonder, you know, I know Chen Hansen is, is uh, Prince's home, and he probably drive over the Memorial Highway a number of times, but during the making of Purple Rain, I wonder whether he had to ride his motorcycle over the highway. I'm just curious, <laughs> out of curiosity. Thank you. It's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. You know, I am not sure, but I am actually curious now and was quizzing my LA earlier on the number of Prince songs she could name, so I got to brush up on more Prince trivia, evidently. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Senator, do you know where the highway operator's manual, the highway manual that is, specifies the color of, of uh, memorial signs, does that need to be modified so that uh, we follow the rules here so that it can be legislated to be a different color, for instance? Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's actually a fantastic question. If it does, I have spoken to members of Congress that have um, represented this area in the past that are interested in helping get this across the finish line in the color we'd like to see it done. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Whatever I can do to help. <laughs> All right. Well, no doubt we'll. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I do know that uh, the Department of Transportation has communicated um, a couple of things, you know, the issue of the 
designation that already exists in the stretch. I think Senator Coleman uh, responded to that in a satisfactory manner. Um, the issue of payment is, is actually not an issue because and we have the fiscal note here, but it's kind of a moot point because the money has been raised privately and actually the Department of Transportation is disallowed from proceeding until the money is, is in hand from um, uh, external sources. Um, and that has been satisfied. And then, then it comes down to the issue of the color of the sign. And um, I think just like with the uh, umlaut over the O's for Lindstrom, um, you know, once in a while we can be a little bit flexible. So I support um, proceeding with the sign uh, in the purple color. I don't think great damage will be done to transportation or traffic safety if that were to occur. And I think it would be weird um, for it to not be purple, quite honestly. So, <laughs> so uh, I think the the um, bill should remain as we see it in front of us. Anything further, members? All right, with that, uh, Senator Coleman, do you have a motion? Are we sending this? We can go to the floor. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been a while since I've done this. Um, what's the bill number? It's 279. Uh, I move that Senate file 279 be recommended to pass and move to general orders. Yes. All right. I haven't forgotten it. <laughs> All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. <laughs> Motion carries. All right. Senator McEwen. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Please proceed on Senate File 577. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to be the lead author of Senate File 577. Um, and I, um, I do have an author's amendment, if I could address that first. So that would be the A1 amendment, Senator McEwen? Correct, correct, right. Mr. Chair. And a little bit of just background on the author's amendment. Um, the primary fiscal impact of Senate File 577 is reduced revenue from driver's license reinstatement fees. And there are several organizations such as the Brain Injury Alliance um, and the BCA that receive revenue from those reinstatement fees. We don't want this legislation to result in their being underfunded, so the author's amendment transfers money from the general fund to offset um, the projected impact to those other funds. So Senator McEwen moves the author's amendment, uh, the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, Senator McEwen, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a little bit on the background of Senate File um, 577. The, what this bill does is recognize that there are unique challenges that people face who have um, been incarcerated and spent time in prison when they are exiting prison and they are working to reintegrate themselves into our community and our society. Um, so they often, as we, we know, struggle to um, establish and then to maintain stable housing, employment, um, and to get those things back in order. Um, also, oftentimes they're under a... Um, uh, under a probation or a, a parole a arrangement, so they're under they're being supervised, and they have things that they're required to complete, such as counseling or treatment. Uh, they have to go meet with uh, a parole officer uh, and f fulfill all the requirements of that supervision. So they have those requirements that they have to meet as well during that period when they exit prison, um, and. 
and thirdly, a lot of them are working on um, really profound issues of family uh, reunification. Uh, people who are sent to prison, um, if they have children, oftentimes they're separated from those children and other family members, and, and they need to reestablish those connections and able, and so that they can move forward in a positive way. So they have a lot on their plates exiting prison, and um, what um, Senate file. 577 does is it establishes a temporary driver's license at no cost to people who are recently released from incarceration. So that makes it possible for them to do what they need to do to get that uh, reintegration driver's license in place so that when they exit prison, they have the re what they need to be able to fulfill all those requirements and to truly make their reintegration meaningful. What we don't want and what currently happens sometimes is that people who exit prison are faced with these barriers simply because they don't have a driver's license that is valid to be able to literally complete the things that they need to complete and to do the things that they need to do to meaningfully reintegrate back into the community. Um, so, um, and, and I guess one of the pieces that people should understand is that when someone is sent to prison, oftentimes what they'll find when they're ready to exit prison and come back into society, they may have outstanding issues with the driver's license that they were not able to resolve while they were in prison. So normally, without this reintegration driver's license and the situation that we have right now is they, they exit prison and they find that the driver's license has been suspended. And it's a huge barrier oftentimes because there will be a lot of fees that they would need to pay before they would be eligible to reapply for that license and to get their driver's license back. So that really does um, set the table for, for why we need this special license for people who are uniquely in this situation. Um, so just a couple things about what this, this driver's license would do. It doesn't forgive any fees that are owed. Those fees, people are still responsible for the fees that they may owe. But what it does, again, is provide them with the means to be able to carry out the requirements that they need to fulfill and also to maintain employment, connection with family, all of the things that people need to do in their daily lives. So it doesn't forgive the fines, but it does give them a very clear pathway to getting what they need to get done done, and then also getting their standard driver's license um, as well. They need to then, so if they get this reintegration driver's license upon exiting prison, they have a year to go ahead and apply then for a standard driver's license, which would then be issued to them, provided that they don't have any uh, violations during the course of that year that would, of course, cause them not to be able to have a driver's license. That if they have that year and it goes well, they will be able to get their driver's license. And oftentimes, also, people should know that um, these fees that people would owe upon exiting prison it, we heard some testimony earlier um, in regard to a previous bill about how sometimes these fees can really pile up. People can owe thousands of dollars in fines um, after some time has passed. And um, what will happen is they'll often be working a payment plan or they, this would have been sent, the fines would have been sent to collections. Um, so yeah, that, that really does sort of give you a basic sense of, of what the reintegration driver's license is all about. You also have a packet that we have, um, I believe is part of the handouts that were provided today to give you some um, benchmarks about the bill. Um, it's available to individuals, the special driver's license, who have spent at least 180 days incarcerated. Um, people have to apply for it within a year of their release. 
Um, it expires 15 months after it is issued. So again, then they have a year to be able to apply for um, the standard driver's license. Um, and it's also, there's a, there's a safeguard in it because that, this reintegration driver's license will be canceled if the driver commits any new violations that would cause a suspension or a revocation of a driver's license. There's also a certain set of people who are not eligible under this uh, bill. So those people who have committed a violation that requires them to use an ignition interlock are not eligible. Um, if their driver's license has been canceled as an inimical to public safety, if they had had a criminal vehicular operation conviction, um, or if they have an unresolved hold for child support. Um, so there's, there's categories of people who wouldn't be eligible for this um, for um, the reasons that we set forth. But really, this is just a very common sense way to allow that people are able to actually um, do the things that they need to do to show accountability and to show that they are, are doing the things that they need to do to reintegrate themselves into community after exiting prison. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple of um, testifiers in support of Senate File 577, and then we also have uh, a testifier, I believe, online. Thank you. Uh, so yes, we have, I'm sorry, I was slightly distracted there. Um, I think next up, if I was tracking with half an ear, is E. Runyon to testify via Zoom. And, and we have two people here to testify um, sitting next to me also in support of the bill. Uh, welcome, Ms. Runyon. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. And members of the committee for this opportunity to testify in favor of the reintegration driver's license bill. My name is Eve Runyon. I'm president and CEO of a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. called Pro Bono Institute. My organization seeks to promote justice for individuals in underserved communities. Primarily, we work with major law firms and companies around the country to encourage lawyers to provide pro bono services to those in need. In Minnesota, we serve on the steering committee of the Minnesota Collaborative Justice Project which brings together different organizations to improve reentry outcomes for individuals who are returning to the community from federal and state facilities. The Collaborative Justice Project includes representatives from law firms and companies in Minnesota, legal services organizations, the Department of Corrections, Bureau of Prisons, Minnesota Probation and Pretrial Services, as well as nonprofit organizations that provide services to individuals returning to the community. We understand the challenges that not having a driver's license presents to individuals trying to reintegrate into the community. It's a barrier faced by many of the individuals at the organization the collaborative work with every day and that we collectively serve as a project. Not having a driver's license impedes individuals' ability to find and maintain employment, obtain housing, and reestablish family connections, as well as attend treatment and other community supervision requirements that are necessary for reentry. Having a driver's license can be an important first step to successful reentry. I would like to thank all the agencies that have provided technical assistance on the reintegration bill, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Human Services, and especially the Department of Public Safety. I would also like to thank the authors of the bill, Senator McEwen, Chair Dibble, Senator Marty, Bata, and Senator Rarick. Thank you today for this opportunity to share and uh, to share my support of the reintegration driver's license bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Senator McEwen, who would you like to testify next? Um, perhaps um, to my left, that would be good. Thank Welcome you. to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dibble and committee members. My name is Jamie Rigling, and I am employed at United States Probation and Pretrial Services here in the District of Minnesota as a community intervention administrator. And I assist those transitioning from any of the 122 federal prisons across the nation. Prior to this role, I worked at the Waseca Federal Prison as the Reentry Affairs Coordinator. And we know those leaving incarceration typically struggle to meet the very basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, let alone any ability to pay old traffic tickets. For 13 years, I have witnessed hundreds of people released with an immediate barrier to driving from these fines they incurred to pr years prior to incarceration. 
I began to notice that many of these alleged driving offenses had been left in pending status in our state court men's system. And once I started seeing a trend of those releasing from custody, I had to start telling them not to pay the fines and fees because those consequences to the conviction would lead to suspension. It was difficult to understand and to explain not to pay your tickets when they should have been paying them to do the right thing. To date, um, this, this means if someone released in 2022 and they had tickets that were a decade old and they started paying them, they would lose their license to up to a year, which is very counterproductive for me and my office and the clients and their families and all the community members. In just my office, 20% of my clients are impacted by this on a day-to-day -day basis, and I have around 150 federal probationers here in our communities in Minnesota with this barrier right now. It's difficult to guide them to employment, especially in rural Minnesota. After speaking to other service providers who assist other individuals with these driver's license issues, there was a unanimous realization that a reintegration bill was needed, which is why we have elevated this to a level of a systems change and the reason I am here before you today. Allowing for this opportunity would not only help clients, the courts, the hearing officers, they would not be buried in those old cases and they could attend to the current offenses, perhaps more serious in nature than the outstanding driving tickets from a decade ago. I'm asking you consider how this legislation might change the trajectory of somebody's life and their family's life after incarceration. It's well documented that maintaining employment after incarceration reduces recidivism, improves outcomes, and increases all of our public safety. This group of licensed drivers will be able to be insured on our roads to, renew, to reduce the number of uninsured drivers on the roads we're all driving on. The states of Mississippi and Louisiana have already passed similar legislation to increase their public safety while empowering those releasing from prison with an opportunity to gain and maintain employment to pay those outstanding fees and fines. It is my belief here in Minnesota that we can demonstrate similar support and offer an earlier transportation intervention by removing this barrier with this proposed bill. Thank you, Chair Jebel and committee members for your consideration. Thank you, Senator McKeown. Thank you, and then we have Mr. Gentle also to offer some testimony and support. Welcome, Mr. Gentle. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Devil and community members. My name is Javon Gentle. I have been married for 17 years and have 10 children. My wife and I have owned a carpet cleaning business in Savage, Minnesota for nearly a decade. In 2019, I was sentenced to two years of time in federal prison in Elkton, Ohio. In June of 2020, I learned that I was not eligible for placement at a halfway house because of the amount of tickets, traffic tickets I had prior to my incarceration. That was not helpful. I needed to be in Minnesota so I could meet with the DMV agents and attend court hearings related to these outstanding tickets. I contacted Jamie at probation and she connected me to an attorney who helped clear up a couple tickets to remove the detainer so that I could be transferred to Minnesota to sort out some of the, to sort out the rest of the fees and fines I had. When I arrived at the halfway house, I learned that I had, I had, I had over $5,000 in outstanding court fees from tickets that were decades old. I had, I had several, court hearing, several court hearings and made agreements with courts while paying fees. Little did I know, by paying some of the tickets, the punishment would continue for six more months. When I found that out, I am glad that I had a good support system because it hit me hard. My self-esteem started going down and defeat started to kick in. I almost gave up and went back to, to the lifestyle of driving without a license. I was putting strain on my family and friends. I, had, I was putting strain on my family and friends and I had already served my time of incarceration and was ready to live a meaningful life abiding by the driving's laws. Because I didn't have a valid driver's license, I missed out on employment opportunity one of those was making $24 an hour. I was not able, I was not able to help 
help out with my part of the business to drive the van, to drive the carpet cleaning business van. Worst of all, I couldn't drive my kids to and from school or to their sport activities for the past couple years. I'm happy to report two weeks ago today, at the age of 42, I'm a valid driver, I'm a valid driver and I drove here today legally with car insurance to pursue you to pass this important law. Having driving privileges, having, having driving privileges increase my self-esteem and motivate because it allows me to share transportation needs for our family. There is nothing more satisfied than dropping off and picking up my kids from school. I can run errands and drive the family van to clean carpets now. I know my friends and family and my wife are, are happy because it was draining on their time and energy giving me rides all the time. It is my hope that nobody else goes through this type of barriers for two and a half years like I did because of mistakes I made in my 20s or 30s. Thank you, Chair Devil and community members. Please consider how important it is to have a driver's license upon release from incarceration to generate an income to pay the fines. Thank you, Mr. Gentle. Uh, members, questions, discussion, or amendments on Senate File 577? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair Dibble and Senator McEwen. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at line 2.13, 2, 2.13, and it talks about who the commissioner cannot issue a license to. And I see you identified 7, 8, 10, and 11. Is there a reason why we didn't take all of subdivision 1 and we just identified 7, 8, 10, and 11? Senator McEwen. Thank you very much um, for the question. I'm just going to pull that subsection up. And we also, um, I might ask um, our um, advocate here who has helped um, with some of the details on this bill to speak with that, if I might, Ms. Odegaard. Okay. Ms. Odegaard. Yeah, I've got okay. it. Mr. Chair? Please proceed. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. Sure, thank you. This is, my name is Anna Odegaard. I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. Thank you for the question, Senator Howe. Uh, we sat down and had a conversation with the Department of Public Safety. Um, we started with the eligibility categories for this license, matching the eligibility categories for a limited license, which is already a fairly well-known statute um, that allows folks to get a license primarily to, to get back and forth to work. Um, but as we were going through the categories that are eligible for a limited license, there were certain ones we felt like should not be eligible for this license because our goal really was to eliminate barriers for folks for whom the barrier was primarily financial, but not to have folks that might pose a danger on the road get back onto the road via this license. Um, so we, we chose those clauses. Um, one would be, so clause seven is somebody who's legally incompetent or meant by, by way of a mental illness. Um, number 10 is if somebody's canceled inimical to public safety, which often is multiple DUIs, they would not be eligible. Um, and clause 11 is, um, deemed a danger by the commissioner due to a mental or physical incapacity. Um, I skipped number eight there, it's a little bit different. Number eight is somebody whose license has also expired, and so what they need to do is take the test. They need to say maybe a road test, maybe the knowledge test, um, and we definitely want once they've cleared that up for them to be eligible. But we really felt like those were categories that should not be immediately eligible for that reintegration license, and that's why we, we selected those out. Mr. Chair. Senator Howell. Thank you, Chair Dibble. Well, with that, you know, I look at number 12, a person who's unable to read or understand official signs regulating warning and directive traffic, uh, a child who the court has ordered denial of driving privileges to any person who has been canceled during the period of cancellation. Uh, you know, to number six, to any drug-dependent person as defined by Section 254A.02, uh, I think uh, 
what I believe in reading, and I just read this whole piece, I could go down the whole piece, and some of it doesn't apply here, but, you know, for persons under 18 years of age. But I don't see why we wouldn't have the entire uh, subdivision one. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll offer the, the A2 amendment. Senator Howe offers the A2 amendment. Basically what the A2 amendment does is, is deletes everything after subdivision one and applies everything in 171.04, persons not eligible for a driver's license. Then we're not picking and choosing. It's already in statute and all those folks that we don't believe should get a driver's license won't get a driver's license. And so the people that are drug dependent, uh, the person who's required under Minnesota Null Fault to provide proof of financial responsibility and who has not provided the proof. We want people that are on the road to have proof of insurance, that type of thing. So I think this just makes sure that we're applying equal, the same responsibilities to, that we have for everyone else to get on the road we're applying that to these folks when they get these driver's license. And so that's the amendment. Senator McKeown. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Howe, for the suggestion. Um, as I understand it, and perhaps um, Ms. Odegaard can also speak to this if she has anything else to, to add to the comments, but I, I'm looking at one of the items here in um, Statute 171.04. Um, for example, there's a subdivision um, 3.5. And that talks about um, insurance issues. So I, 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 I'm very well aware that the advocates on this bill worked hand in hand with our agencies to decide which of these provisions were most important to include in this legislation. Um, that is just one example that we wouldn't want in there. So I, I guess as we go forward, I am um, open to, and I'd love to, I would have preferred to, perhaps before we talked, brought it today to have some discussion about this, but if there are certain pieces that we would want to add, I, I think we're certainly open to that, but I'm not comfortable changing it at this point. It seems like that's too broad of a brush. So I would ask um, at this point members to reject the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Well, Senator McEwen, I can't believe that we would like to uh, uh, item six to any drug dependent person. I can't believe that that's not a piece of this. Uh, I would think that the most of the folks that are going to be coming out have beat that because they've been incarcerated for six months. They haven't been able to get on it. I would think that they're probably not a piece of that. If they're still drug dependent, uh, I don't understand why we would treat these folks. I mean, we're already giving them a driver's license and we're already working on it. I think these people are already prohibited. So is the key that they're that you got to be incarcerated for 181 days to come out and get the driver's license because otherwise you can't get the driver's license. And I think that's a, I don't know why we would do that to have a double standard like that. Uh, so I believe, and, I, and I, I don't know where we would fix this if we don't fix this in transportation because I don't think it's relevant in any other committee. Yeah, if I might, Mr. Chair. Um, so four also refers to insurance. Five insures, or five also are. Uh, five. I'll, yeah, 
It, the, the, basically, when we worked with the Department of Public Safety, this, that was not an item that we flagged. Discussing it together at this point, if subdivision six, if we wanted to add subdivision six specifically, we don't have a problem adding subdivision six. Again, the Department of Public Safety did not include that in the flags that they wished to be added to the bill language. Um, but again, the amendment that we have in front of us that you propose, Senator Howe, is um, um, much, um, much too broad and encompasses things that we don't want to have in, in the bill. It, I mean, as I understand it, what your amendment would do is delete everything after subdivision one on page two, line 13. Um, I'd, well, I'm happy with the bill language as, as it is now, but if we want to talk further um, before we would well, and, have this finalized, that's fine. Senator McCune and, and members, you know, this, this bill is, we're laying this on the table for possible future inclusion because it's a fiscal, it has a fiscal implication. So we'll have time to, to work on it, you know, and if there are some elements in this list of 171.04 uh, um, that should be included like, you know, item six, et cetera, we'll have an opportunity to have further discussion. Um, that would be my encouragement for us to work with each other um, outside of uh, the committee when we want to make these kinds of, of changes, like I want to do with Senator Jasinski's bill. So we kind of held that over. Um, and I apologize for not actually, I think I flagged it a little bit beforehand, but uh, I just didn't have the time to work up some actual language. So, but we're going to work it out. Um, so, with that, members, anything further on the A2? All right. All in favor of the A2 say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. 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 Motion does not prevail. All right. Members, discussion, amendments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Questions. Chair and Senator McEwen. So uh, one of my concerns with doing a lot of work with the deputy registers is uh, it looks like in your bill you're not allowing a DLAs to charge a fee. And a lot of these businesses are private businesses. Some are city-owned, some are county-owned. Um, and I don't believe that we cannot charge someone. I think that should be charged. So uh, with that, I have the A3 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A3 amendment. Senator Jasinski, go ahead and describe it while it comes around. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, what this does is uh, allocates $3,000 in fiscal year 2024 and $10,000 in fiscal 25 are appropriated from the general fund uh, to the Commissioner of Public Safety for the distribution of driver's license agents to replace the revenue from filing fees prohibited under Minnesota Statutes uh, Section 171.301, Subdivision 3, Paragraph A, Clause 2. So basically this recoups the fees that they're not being able to be charged uh, so that our deputy registers uh, aren't uh, not being able to charge fees. So. Senator McEwen. Thank you, um, Chair Dibble. I'm going to ask if Ms. Odegaard can speak to some of the um, details fiscally about this provision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Odegaard. Thanks for that question, Senator Jasinski. We did talk this through, um, the, and we did the, the calculations. So yeah, there's a, there's a loss of potentially per year about $8,000 to the DLA's um, offices. There are 300 DLA offices across the state. So when I did the calculations, um, kind of the potential is that they might lose $27 each per year. Um, so, uh, and, and the other consideration as we were having that conversation is, um, this assumes that everybody who gets a reintegration license would otherwise have simply gone through the regular channels and gotten a, a regular valid driver's license, which if that were the case, we wouldn't need this bill. The problem is most of these people can't get a license anyway, and so it's not really foregone revenue to the DLAs if that person would not have been able to get that license. Um, the real advantage to the DLAs is, is that if somebody is able to maintain this reintegration license for 12 months, they can then go in, and at that point, they do have to pay all the regular fees, including the $8 filing fee to the DLAs. Um, and so they would, they would pay that fee, um, and, and we feel like people are much more likely to be able to do that 12 months in if they've been able to have this license than they would without this help. Um, so I acknowledge there may be a $27 a year loss to individual DLA offices, hopefully to be recouped 12 
months hence when that person gets their regular license. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator and again, Kaczynski. Again, the problem is they're, they're going through the work twice and they're only getting paid once. If you if use that reasoning, again, they have to go through the full time it takes to reissue this type of driver's license and not get paid anything for it. And again, these deputy registers survive on their fees and already they've uh, been 90% of the work's been, or not 90%, a large portion of the work's been reassigned to deputy registers and not at the actual back office. So they're doing more work and now you're taking that money away saying they don't, aren't able to charge. So again, I have an issue with this because we have many, many deputy registers across state and this comes from the general fund. This doesn't come from the person applying. Uh, it just backfills that amount uh, to our already uh, people that are already under duress from not collecting the fees uh, that they need to when they're doing all this extra work. So again, I think it's a friendly amendment. I think it, it supports our deputy registers uh, and they should not be doing work for free. They're, they're a private business and they should not be having to do work for fee for free. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if we could pause for one moment, I was remiss in not, uh, if you don't mind, in the middle of your motion, of your amendment discussion here, if we could have um, fiscal, just describe the fiscal note quickly so we get a little bit grounded in that. Uh, Ms. Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the fiscal note um, has to do with the fact that the bill does not allow um, DVS to charge driver's license fees, including filing fees and reinstatement fees, or driver's license agents from charging filing fees for these reintegration licenses. So what's in the fiscal note um, is a list of um, uh, revenue loss. Uh, there are quite a number of fees on, uh, there's a number of fees and then they go to different places. So the, the fiscal note is just laying out the lost revenue um, based on some assumptions, um, which are on the bottom of page two, that each year 5,000 Minnesotans are released from confinement, and the fiscal note assumes that 24% of those individuals would be eligible for the reintegration license, um, and then the revenue loss is calculated on those assumptions. So um, there would be revenue lost um, to the driver services operating account for some reinstatement fees, um, to the uh, general fund, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension account and the vehicle forfeiture account um, for uh, the larger reinstatement fee and the surcharge of that, um, the $430 surcharge on that reinstatement fee is split between the traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury account and the remote electronic alcohol monitoring program account. So that, that would also, those accounts would also face a loss of revenue. I'm sorry, I'm not putting numbers to these if, if you'd like me to. Um, um, for instance, a vehicle forfeiture account in a given year would lose uh, $7,500 in revenue. The remote, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm skipping around too much. Let me pause for a second, Mr. Chair. The traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury account would lose $30,000 a year. The remote electronic alcohol monitoring program account would lose $228,000 a year. Um, then there's a loss of revenue uh, to the driver and vehicle services technology account because of waived technology surcharge fees, and that would total $2,700 a year. Um, and then uh, the driver services operating account, I don't have that totaled here, but they would lose quite an, uh, they would lose um, 18,000 plus 30,000 plus 25,000 plus about $1,200 from various parts of the fees. Um, the total impact of that in a given year would be about $455,000, and that does not include the um, fees lost to the filing fee for the driver's license agent. Um, there's also an absorbed cost of programming for MinDrive for these reintegration licenses of about $24,000. Again, that would be absorbed um, by the DVS technology account. Um, Oh, and I just wanted to point out that the A1 amendment that was adopted um, would pick up the last three months of 20, uh, fiscal year 24 and all of fiscal year 25 costs and would make these accounts whole from uh, transfers from the general fund. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, Senator McEwen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Double. Um, you know, I, I was just uh, to the A3 amendment, if, if I might. Um, I, I appreciate, um, Senator Jaszynski, the desire to want to um, 
make sure that these offices don't um, aren't forced to do work for free, as you had stated it, even though we're talking about uh, $27 per office when we actually um, lay out the numbers. Um, and actually, as um, we heard from our testifier here also, it, it, I think that this is gonna be a win-win um, when it comes down to it. But one of the things I'm concerned about with the A3 amendment is that I, I worry that about the cost of just DVS having to figure out which of the offices um, are owed these funds, having to coordinate all of that. It just, um, when we're talking about making sure that people have their driver's license and then are brought back into the system, I think that that net gain is there. It's part of the process of what we're trying to reestablish here. And I think that this is almost like, um, a solution in search of a problem after we actually think about the ramifications of all of it. So um, I am going to ask members at, at this point that we not adopt the A3 amendment. Mr. Chair. Senator Zinsky. Uh, just responding to that, so again, so we don't know that one office could be 27 and one, I mean, you're taking an average of all the offices dividing it, so one area might get hit particularly bad. Uh, maybe it's Hennepin or Scott County or Rice County, I don't, I don't know, maybe they get hit with a bunch and some counties don't get hit with anything, but I do know with the MinDrive, the new system, I think it's fairly easy to track back and forth what, what their transactions are. And I know a lot of money get exchanged back and forth between DVS and DPS and our deputy registers, so I think it's a, a fairly simple thing to do. And again, uh, we've done so much, and I know you weren't here in the first couple of years in 2016, 2017 when we had Minlar's, uh, Senator McEwen, but these deputy registers have been through hell and back and they're having to do more work. Uh, they're not making the, the money they used to. Uh, it's been very difficult for them. So again, we're, we're doing legislation here that further damages our deputy registers. And again, if we knew it was $27, I could maybe look at that, but we don't know that. And you're taking a statewide average and you don't know. And again, I believe DPS and DVS can track it very simply. Uh, so again, I'd ask for a green vote. I think it's a fairly straightforward uh, thing so we don't damage our deputy registers any further. Anything further? Just, just briefly, um, you know, we've been working on this legislation for a while. Um, this was legislation that um, I believe Senator Osmick was working on last year. I was working on it briefly. I, I think there's a lot of openness, and there has been a lot of openness on the part of advocates to address issues just like this. Um, so, seeing it right now, I mean, I. I I, again, I think that we're open if we talk to DVS and DPS and they say, yes, with the systems that we have, this would actually um, be fairly easy to do, then we can look at and go ahead at changing that. But um, as it stands now, I, I don't want to make that change. So I would ask members to not, um, to vote no on the A3. Mr. Chair, I ask for roll call. Um, so roll call has been requested. Um, Senator McEwen, I, I, I want you to be sure you to be aware that I am actually supportive of Senator Jasinski's request. I think it's a small, a small matter. I understand your points and respect those, uh, but um, you know, and like I, like I've mentioned before, this bill is going to be held over, so there's more time to to work out some of the particulars. One of the questions I do have on the A3, of course, is, um, you know, if we're if we're keeping uh, DR's whole, and what about the agency um, if if they're going to be handling some of these transactions as well? So. Didn't want you to be surprised or feel blindsided. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, though uh, the clerk will take the roll on the A3. If there's nothing further, I should ask. If there's anything further on the A3? All right. Clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Port? No.
with six yeses and four noes, the A3 is, um, is adopted. Members, questions, comments? Questions, comments, discussion, or amendments? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, uh, after the discussion and, and hearing the uh, walk through the fiscal note, uh, and I look at what we did with the A1 amendment, I would, uh, you know, I, I think that, that this money is going to be ongoing that we're going to lose. So I'm going to submit that we, this, those, this should be ongoing. And so I'll offer the A5 amendment, but with the A5 amendment from line 1.17 to 1. Uh, two one, uh, that was in the Jasinski amendment. So I'll make an oral amendment to delete 1.17 to 1.21 so it doesn't confuse the issue. So basically what this does is take the same appropriations that were made in the A1 and makes it over two years. So like in 1.14, it'll be 3,000 in 2024 and 12,000 in 2025. So basically it's the same money, but it's split over two years. And Senator uh, Howe, I think actually your amendment would be 1.16 to 1.21. I stand corrected. You're right. And just a, a, a clarification. Um, actually, Ms. Boyd, why don't you explain what you just explained to me so I don't mess it up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry, but what, uh, what the, thank you, what the amendment does is takes the amounts from the A1 amendment that was adopted, um, that was a one-time transfer in fiscal year 24, this makes it into a, a transfer in the last, you know, the smaller amount for the last three months of 24, the needed amount for fiscal year 25 to make these accounts whole, and then it makes it an ongoing transfer every year after that, whereas the A1 was one-time money. And Senator Howe, is that, is that your intention? That's the intention because uh, this isn't just a one-time loss for these folks. This is an ongoing loss for those funds. And uh, so when you're talking the brain injury in spinal cord, when you're talking about the electronic, electronic alcohol monitoring program, those are, those are programs that we, we can't actually just stop funding. And if we're going to shortchange them, if this makes them whole for one year, we should continue to make them whole. And, and instead, of, instead of putting a Band-Aid on it and then not funding them, I think we need to make that an ongoing funding and acknowledge that uh, that short changes those programs ongoing. And this would fix that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And then I'm going to ask Council. Um, council, do we need to take uh, a vote on amending? Or is, has Senator Howe simply offered the A5 absent the 1.16 through 1.21? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, members, I think you can just incorporate the deletion of those lines. All right. Thanks. All right. So, uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Chair Dibble. Um, I think it would be good to talk to DPS about... Um, about this, and um, again, I'm not crazy about making changes um, when so much work has gone into the consideration of this bill without having discussed this with them. That said, I'm not I'm not opposed um, necessarily to extending the um, time. It just it, it's an a, an additional expense in, a, in addition to what we already. Um, provided for in the A1 amendment. So um, I, I guess, you know, if, if we have a suggestion that we, that we double that up, then if that's what the committee would like to do, and if that's um, the way we'd like to proceed, I don't have any great opposition to it, but I, I do sort of um, think it would have been best to talk with DPS first. Mr. Chair, DBS is here. If they're opposed, they could let us know right now. Uh, 
Director Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Uh, we, we, we would like some more time to look into this. Um, you know, uh, the Min Drive system is much more uh, sophisticated now. Uh, but to, I think to properly answer this question, we really need to explore how we can, we can uh, uh, achieve that with the current system. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Director. Uh, this is providing funds for those, for those different revenue accounts, special revenue accounts. What is there to, to look at? Because uh, if we've already determined that this is what it would short and we did the A1, this would provide that funding ongoing. Uh, I don't understand. Can you explain to me what needs to be looked at with the men drive system? Because it looks, it appears to me that you did the, the math already and we just uh, provided it ongoing. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, uh, I, I think there are other portions of the administration of, of, of transferring financials through the system that we would need to consider uh, the timing, uh, the amounts. Uh, these are estimates uh, that are provided. Uh, there are other questions like um, if the amounts are more or less than what are appropriate, what are, what, what are, those, what are the implications of those things, and, um, and the timing of which, which uh, the financial transactions are required uh, would create uh, more or less burden depending on how we administer that. And so I think there, there's just more pieces to this that we would want to consider and, and advise or, or provide our, our thoughts on if, if possible. All right. Mr. asked for roll call. All right. Uh, Senator Jasinski asked for a roll call. Uh, roll call will be taken. Anything further, members? On the A5 amendment, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Port? No. On a vote of four yeses and six noes, the A5 amendment does not pass. Members, anything further on Senate File 577? Mr. Chair, I have one more amendment. I just have a tough time finding it right now, but uh, what's the number? Mr. I offer the A8 amendment. Senator Jasinski offers the A8 amendment. Senator Jasinski, if you want to start describing it as it comes around. For some reason, I lost my copy of it, so I get one to explain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for that. I don't know where it went. But uh, So with the discussion, we've talked about farm permits. We've talked about dis disability helping, uh, and all those driver's licenses have something indicating them on the back. So uh, what this does, it would uh, have the commissioner must include an indicator on the back of the license indicating that it is a reintegration driver's license. Again, I've, I've voiced my frustration. Uh, we met here a week ago or so, 10 days ago, and uh, we were not taking anything different from what a Class D was. There was no designation differently for our uh, driver's license for non-citizens. Uh, I, I think that was a bad mistake that we did, uh, but uh, this, I think, is something is very similar to a, a farm permit or a disabled permit uh, to do that, so this basically puts the language on the back of the card, and I'd offer or ask for a green vote. And I ask for roll call. All right. Uh, Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Jasinski for um, this idea in the A8 amendment. Um, as I understand it, this was uh, looked at uh, making this the license appear um, differently. However, 
The expiration is already going to be different, so there's already going to be a mark of what it would be like when you're looking at the license based on what the expiration um, would save depending uh, from when it was issued to when it expires. Additionally, the court system would already show in its, um, in its system that this is a reintegration license. And then uh, really what it comes down to is there's a cost to creating a different looking license um, for this specific purpose. Um, so um, for those reasons, I just, I, I don't see the necessity of, of creating something that that looks different um, just for the purpose of, of having, just for that purpose um, with the expense. So um, members, I would ask um, you to vote no on the A8 amendment. Mr. Chair, just to follow up, so you said there would be a mark on Senator McEwen, you said there is a mark on it. Uh, that's my question. Again, this should be marked on the back that disseminates that it, it's a reintegration driver's license. Just like a farm permit or just like a disabled permit, I, I, I don't see why we're doing it for one and not the other. We're picking winners and losers of why we're doing one and not the other. I think there should be some consistency and we're not being consistent in this committee. We're not doing that, and, and we just got done with an example an hour ago in this committee and 10 days ago in this committee, uh, or whatever days, was, eight or nine days ago, and now we're doing something differently again. Again, I, I yeah, think Senator, we should be consistent. Uh, I'll, I'll respond quickly, and then I'll call on Senator Herr and then Senator Ports. Um, there is a difference. The difference is that in the farm uh, driver, they can only go within 40 miles around the point um, which they're, uh, so they're, substantially restricted, so there is useful information that law enforcement would need to have at the point at which um, they may intersect or interface with the holder of a farm permit if they're, you know, having a party down in the Twin Cities and they live 200 miles away, um, that's not allowed. Um, there's no restriction on where folks can drive, the time of day, et cetera, with these licenses. Uh, Senator Herr. Senator Port. That was my point as well, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, anything further on the A8? All right. Uh, Senator Howe. You point. know, taking out my... Uh, Sen uh, Mr. Chair, are we going to vote on that or are we just going to... Senator Howe had a... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Mr. Chair, you know, I took out my driver's license and it doesn't cost anything to put anything on the back. Uh, it is they just print it out so like I got an endorsement motorcycle endorsement uh, but you, what you're saying is uh, well maybe I'm going to get more information <laughs> director Zhang mr. chair uh, members of the committee thank you uh, there there would be a cost associated to creating a, a different type of credential if there were uh, markings that do not currently exist um, the restriction uh, real estate already exists and it does change the, the, the driving privileges of that credential. And so at the, the credential, is, I mean the restriction itself uh, is something that's already incorporated into, into the design of the license. If we were to add a marking that would look different from another credential, that would be a different design that we would need to implement and, and administer. Thank you. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Director, is there, when we put the veterans des designator on there, did that cost us? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, yes, it, uh, it did. We, we had to d redesign the credential. Um, and I'll just add that, uh, that while some credentials have a lot, appear to have a lot of real estate, that real estate is, has been absorbed and designated for different types of markings. When you say real estate, you're referring to the amount of space available on the card? Mr. Chair, yes, the, the, the white space on the card or the blank space on the card may appear to be not leveraged, uh, but on, on different credentials, they are leveraged and we, we put those in the same um, areas or, or that space on the card. Okay. When you say leveraged, this is like <laughs> a different language you use. Leveraged means what? Mr. Chair, uh, there's printing that's, that's designated uh -huh. for that space if the, that credential requires that to be printed on it. All right, thank you. All right, anything further, members, on the A8 amendment? A, re a roll call has been requested. 
clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? No. Vice Chair Morrison? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Herr? No. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Port? No. With four yes votes and six no votes, the A8 amendment is not adopted. All right. Anything further, members? All right. So, sure. uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, I just want to make a couple closing comments. And, and again, I, you know, I've been around here for a while, and I, I keep hearing a driver's license is a privilege. And, and I think we're going farther and farther that we're showing the driver's license apparently is a right. Um, and, and I don't agree with that because, uh, you know, I've listened before. But uh, so, Senator McEwen, in, under your bill, so if someone gets out of prison after vehicular manslaughter, your bill will allow a, driver, a free driver's license without paying any reinstatement fees. Is that correct? That's no. The... Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's one of the exceptions in the bill. I don't believe that the person who is convicted with vehicular manslaughter is eligible under the bill. And Ms. Odegaard, if you could confirm that. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair. There's a whole list of CVO, criminal vehicular operation uh, violations that come with statutory revocation periods. And it, we've been clear in the language that nothing in this language would supersede or override those statutory revocations. Thank you. Senator I'm, Drzinski. I'm getting some conflicting information from what, the thing that I'm seeing. So maybe if we can have staff verify that. So I, I think one that I saw was... Um, well, a DWI with manslaughter can get a driver's license under this. I mean, it doesn't eliminate their fees, a part of that, but as far as getting the driver's license, they'll be getting a free driver's license after serving 180 days in jail. Is that correct? I guess I'll, I'll re-clarify that. Ms. Tangle. Um, Mr. Chair and members, give me one minute. Excuse me. Um, it takes, it, you have to go through a series of um, of cross-references here. So if you look through here, there's a whole series of the cr criminal vehicular operations. Those people are not eligible for reintegration license. So specifically vehicular manslaughter, somebody convicted of that is not eligible to get a reintegration license under here. Um, and that's through lines 2.15 takes you through a series of um, cross-references and that's how you get to that answer. Senator Trzinski, if you look at the, the handout, um, there's a box uh, with the eligible and ineligible. Um, ineligible are those who would be required to use ignition interlock, for example, canceled as inimical to public safety, criminal vehicular operation conviction, or those whose um, driver's licenses have been suspended because of child support issues. So does that co cover then again? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Does that cover a DWI manslaughter then? Is as ineligible? Ms. Stengel. I would have to do some double checking with our Judiciary Council. I'm not terribly familiar with the way sometimes we commonly describe things and the way the statutes mm -hmm. describe them. So I'd have to do some double checking to make sure what you're asking cross references with the statute I'm thinking of. So I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. And then just to follow, how about reckless driving? So if reckless driving is one of those, is that in there? Uh, is that el it doesn't say under eligible or ineligible, but if, you are, if you're convicted of reckless driving and you spend 180 days in jail, do you get a free driver's license when you get out? Maybe that's a question for the author or her testifier. Right. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Chair Dibble. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, refer this question to Ms. Odegaard. Ms. Odegaard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski. Just to back up, any CVO violation with an alcohol component, or, um, so you were mentioning a, a DWI manslaughter, would be ineligible. Um, in terms of reckless driving, if there were a revocation as part of the sentence for reckless driving, this would not supersede this. 
if somebody has a reckless driving charge and the reason that their license is revoked when they are released from incarceration is due to, for instance, a payment violation, this, this is designed to help them get that license at no cost if the barrier they're facing is a payment violation. Does that distinction make sense as opposed to if there's a revocation as part of their sentence and that has not expired, this would not supersede that, though likely they would have served that revocation period during their sentence. So if I could rephrase, if they had their license revoked attributable to reckless driving, they would not be eligible. If their license were revoked for another reason, um, because not everyone necessarily has had their driver's license revoked for reckless driving. But if they have their, had had their driver's license revoked for another reason, like non-payment of various fines and fees, they would be able to participate in this initiative. Yes, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Senator Drzezinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. So help me understand, uh, can you explain to me why 180 days was chosen? Because I'm sitting here thinking, if they incarcerate them for 120 days, they're not eligible. But if, they, if they're incarcerated 181 days or more, they are eligible. Why is the 180 days the trigger and how was it determined? I mean, now it sounds like if I get a little, if I can spend a month longer, I'm in, I can get a license for free. If I don't spend that amount of time, I'm... I, I can't get the license. So what, I was just wondering the rationale behind the 180 days, I guess, is what my question is. Thank you. I see someone coming forward. We, we do have, I, I mean, I, uh, just as a preliminary, yeah. thank you, Mr. Chair. As a preliminary note, I would note that um, you know, 180 days is is sort of a, an indicator that someone has spent a, a significant enough amount of time separated out from their community in, in incarceration that it is going to be, um, this is not just a, sh a, a shorter stint in jail, this is actually, um, some some real substantive time that they spent, but with that, um, I believe that we have um, also somebody who was part of some of those conversations about that choice of days in particular, who may be able to offer us some more information. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. I'm Jamie Rigling, um, U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services, and. Truthfully, when I brought this bill to the table, we did a lot of dissecting, we did a lot of research. Um, I'm a clinical social worker, um, an alcohol and drug counselor, and I took evidence-based practice, I took some research that I had learned, and this is the point to where, once you've been separated from, from family for this amount of time, is what the evidence says that we should have adopted, I guess. Um, I don't know if you're, I didn't see the amendment if you're wanting to change the days, but I think anybody, um, I'm a veteran of the military also, and I think once um, we spend six or more months away from our family, we need any sort of reintegration. So that's why the number was pit, was chosen. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I might also offer um, just up for people's information. In my experience when I was working as a public defender also, I think those of us who have worked in the criminal um, system see that there are oftentimes common amounts of time that judges will impose. Um, so you, you don't generally see people sent to um, do time for four months. That's not, not a typical thing. So um, that's just one other piece. Like the people who work in these areas, they understand uh, the common practices and then following best practices as we just heard. I think it's, it's a very reasonable number, the 180 days. All right, thank you. Anything further, members? All right. With that, uh, we will lay uh, Senate File 577 as amended over for possible inclusion in a future bill. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anything further, members? Uh, Ms. Ethier, do you want to let us know what's coming up uh, Wednesday?
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wednesday, we will be focusing on non-motorized transportation safety, and that will include bus school bus safety, bicycle safety, and pedestrian safety, and we will hear a number of bills related to those topics. It will be a bipartisan slate of bills, and we have a very full agenda. We hope you'll join us. And then members next week, um, we'll hear from the agencies, uh, the uh, proposed budgets from the governor, and um, we'll have a number of agency bills, agency policy bills that we'll be working on. With that, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.